On the 4th of April 2022, the IPCC, also known as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, released a dire report on the necessity for an international response to rising carbon emissions. The report proclaimed that in order to prevent a rise in global temperatures above 1.5 Celsius, carbon emissions must peak before 2025, have them cut back by 43% by 2030, and achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. However, the current analysis on carbon emission trends show that carbon emissions are rising, as opposed to declining, which is needed to offset the most catastrophic effects of climate change. The earliest signs of climate crisis can be observed in the melting of the Arctic glaciers, rising sea levels, wildfires in Siberia, California and Australia, droughts in Ethiopia and southern Spain, the immense flooding in Pakistan and to heat waves across the world. Additionally, the future effects of climate change hold the potential to spread locusts, release ancient diseases from the permafrost, and to increase wind capacity and rainfall from tropical cyclones, all of which are related to rising temperatures and the effects of its energy upon ocean, soil and air. On a geopolitical level, the unpredictability of climate change holds profound geopolitical consequences for nation-states and human societies, as some regions, for example, will experience extended periods of unpredictable droughts. It holds the potential for some nations to risk conflict for the acquisition of resources, particularly water, in periods of severe socio-economic decline. As the historian and geopolitical specialist, Gwyn Dyer states in his book called Climate Wars, The Fight for Survival as the World Overheats that the future effects of climate change will stem from a more unstable process involving sudden and possibly in some cases catastrophic changes. It is possible that the effects will be felt more rapidly and widely than anticipated, leading for example to an unexpected increase in extreme weather events, challenging the individual and collective capacity to respond. Water stress will increase, with the risk that disputes over water will contribute significantly to tensions in already volatile regions, possibly triggering military action and population movements. Areas most at risk are in North Africa, the Middle East and Central Asia, including China, whose growing problems of water scarcity and contamination may lead it to attempt to reroute the waters of rivers flowing into neighboring India. The notion of water wars has subsequently defined potential future conflicts. As in the current day, relations between Ethiopia and Egypt have worsened following Ethiopia's establishment of the hydroelectric Grand Renaissance Dam on the Blue Nile River in 2020 which sought to maintain the amount of water within Ethiopia. The Egyptian government has since expressed great concern for the establishment of the dam, as it will mitigate the amount of water entering into the Nile River, potentially threatening economic growth and stability. Both Egypt and Ethiopia face the threat of water shortages at a time when the demand for water is required to maintain growing populations, growing urbanization, and growing economies. In 1979, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat declared that if Egypt were to ever go to war again, it would be over water. In October 2019, regarding the potentials for sabotage or military strikes on the dam, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed warned that no force can stop Ethiopia from building a dam. If there is a need to go to war, we could get millions readied. Since the establishment of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, it has been equipped with Russian and Israeli air defense weaponry. In 2021 alone, 2.6 million people in sub-Saharan Africa were displaced by rising temperatures and climate disasters. The World Bank and United Nations predict that by the mid-21st century, climate refugees from Africa, Asia and Latin America altogether will potentially total between 140 and 200 million refugees, deeming it a hundred times worse than the Syrian refugee crisis. In more alarming detail, the IPCC's sixth assessment report declared the possibilities of up to 250 million displaced peoples on the African continent by the 2030s totaling at 700 million climate refugees altogether by the mid-21st century, as a result of exacerbated climate crisis. As Dyer affirms, Africa is the continent that takes the worst hit from climate change in almost every scenario. In sub-Saharan Africa, hundreds of millions of already vulnerable persons will be exposed to intensified threat of death by disease, malnutrition and strife. The primary cause will be long-term drought, 
but the weakness of the infrastructure in most African countries will lead to a proliferation of failed states that exacerbates all the problems and generates huge waves of refugees. Many will follow the familiar paths north towards Europe, but there will also be a strong southward flow towards South Africa, which will be facing severe drought problems of its own. The crisis of climate refugees would further facilitate military interventions, border conflicts and authoritarian measures initiated to control the mass waves of human migrations in times of desperate measures. Therefore, the climate crisis could be utilized to justify authoritarian regimes, militarized nationalism and the delegitimization of democracy as incapable of meeting the demands set by the state to mitigate the consequences of the climate crisis. As a result of the increased recognition on the threats that climate change pose to the planet, the sustainability of increased economic growth and industrial production have been doubted and called into question, particularly regarding non-renewable fossil fuels, which are largely responsible for the emitting of carbon into the atmosphere during production and consumption processes. Other industrial processes such as fracking risk generating earthquakes and mining can cause acid mine drainage, from which toxins from mined rocks pollute rivers and other water supplies, resulting in a range of devastating public health problems. In terms of ecology specifically, Rapid urban and industrial expansion is encroaching upon and destroying delicate ecosystems, causing the extinction of various plant-based lifeforms and animal lifeforms, which are fundamental components to the biodiversity of Earth and to the inner workings of the ecosystem, which maintains planet-based life. The consequences of climate change are inseparable to the economic system of capitalism, particularly neoliberal capitalism, which has facilitated corporate dominance over nature as a mere resource to serve the interests of a corporate elite and to perpetuate economic growth. The contradictions innate to finite resources and climate change has largely gained the attention of contemporary Marxists, who are becoming more aware of the interconnectedness between capitalist hierarchy, class struggle and ecological sustainability. Whilst the theory of Marxism has been predominantly associated with economic relations, as the ecological critique has largely remained within the domain of environmentalism, other ecological movements have further sought the paradigms of indigenous and eastern philosophical thoughts to better comprehend the human relation to nature outside of the largely anthropocentric Western tradition from which Marxism typically descends. Whilst a part of the Enlightenment tradition, Marxism is notably attributed with a materialist analysis on the world, emphasizing the role of human material conditions along with science and technology in rejection of a Christian worldview. Although, despite the Marxist opposition to capitalism, Marxism in its origin has been aligned with the 19th century progressive notions of persistent economic growth and production, limitless natural resources and nature's use value to serve a socialist or communist society. Regarding human progress, the historian Clive Ponting declares that the acceptance of progress was at the heart of Western thought in men such as Saint Simon, Auguste Comte, Herbert Spencer and John Stuart Mill. Its strongest manifestation is in the thought of Marx and Engels, with their idea of the inevitable progress of human societies through different economic foundations and their related power structures. Human history was, they argued, the march of progress from tribal through feudal and capitalist societies until its climax in the inevitable victory of the proletariat and socialism. Regarding anthropocentrism, political theorist John Barry makes clear that ideologies such as socialism and Marxism have regarded the non-human world as a set of resources for humans to use with no independent moral status. As a consequence, socialism and Marxism may be viewed as anthropocentric, that is, concerned solely with the status and relationships between human beings and not, in the main, with the issue of thinking about a proper ethical relationship between humanity and the environment. However, this monolithic understanding of Marxism as being explicitly technocentric, anthropocentric and unecological is facing considerable opposition, especially as it relates to the writings of Marx himself, as the American sociologist and philosopher John Bellamy Foster has provided considerable analysis on the ecological dimension found within the writings of both Marx and his associate Frederick Engels, as they were historically exposed to the industrial impact on ecology in early to mid 19th century Britain. Foster has therefore sought to reassess Marx and Marxism in the light of ecological crisis and away from simply economic reductionism.
The industrial capitalism of the 21st century relies predominantly on the extracting and burning of fossil fuels to maintain all facets of the hegemonic economic order and to ensure rapid economic growth. The beneficiaries of such a hegemonic order maintain the logic of accumulation for the sake of accumulation to enrich and ensure the stability of the most elite corporate actors even if it comes at the expense of conflict, servitude and poverty. Oil and gas companies ranging from Shell, Gazprom, Chevron, ExxonMobil, Saudi Aramco, British Petroleum and PetroChina yield extensive political and economic power globally, in addition to disseminating misinformation regarding climate change. So as a way to sway public opinion away from the role of oil and gas companies in exacerbating climate change. The reliance of modern industrial capitalism is, however, undermined by the finite amount of non-renewable fossil fuels, which are estimated to run out at some point between the mid to late 21st century. This contradiction innate to modern industrial capitalism has largely reshaped the political and economic understanding of progress and development as shaped through perpetual economic growth. Additionally, pollution and deforestation threaten the Earth's biodiversity and delicate ecosystem and therefore consequently threaten human life. Environmental movements and other ecological movements have notably heralded this understanding, proclaiming that unsustainable growth is a danger to life on this planet overall and that economies and societies must return to pre-capitalist rates of production and consumption based on sufficiency, as opposed to perpetual growth. Despite of their anti-capitalist leanings, environmentalists and ecologists alike have nonetheless been critical of Marxism and its seemingly anthropocentric economic framework, which places the revolutionary transformative role of man above and at the expense of nature. From this perspective, Marxism is no different from free market capitalism or Keynesianism which heralds economic growth and the accumulation of resources as a necessity for human progress. However, this scathing critique of Marxism is largely in reference to the productivist and technocentric manner in which orthodox Marxism came to be associated with 20th century revolutionary societies. Within the framework of orthodox Marxism, the negation of capitalism will arise from within the structure of capitalism itself, especially as it relates to labor capital divides which will inevitably establish a revolutionary working class to seize control of the means of production. As Marx and Engels declare in the Communist Manifesto that, with the development of industry, the proletariat not only increases in number, it becomes concentrated in greater masses, its strength grows, and it feels that strength more. The various interests and conditions of life within the ranks of the proletariat are more and more equalized, in proportion as machinery obliterates all distinctions of labor, and nearly everywhere reduces wages to the same low level. The advance of industry, whose involuntary promoter is the bourgeoisie, replaces the isolation of the laborers due to competition by the revolutionary combination due to association. The development of modern industry, therefore, cuts from under its feet the very foundation on which the bourgeoisie produces and appropriates products. What the bourgeoisie therefore produces, above all, are its own grave diggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. For Marx and Engels, the drive of capitalists to lower wages, replace skilled labor with machines, and excessively increase a surplus of profits at the expense of the workers, establishes an equilibrium among workers who recognize their shared sense of misery and exploitation, and therefore unite to establish a revolutionary worker organization which as a result of deteriorating material conditions will be compelled towards revolutionary action against the capitalist system. For many worker revolutionaries of the early 20th century, this description of a self-annihilating condition of capitalism was a reality in the making. As the means to achieve such revolutionary action in a period of socio-economic decline was of critical importance to the discourse of Bolshevik and Menshevik factions in pre-revolutionary Russia. Whilst the Bolsheviks led by the Russian revolutionary Vladimir Lenin perceived the emergence of revolution as to be guided by an all-encompassing revolutionary workers' party which was to be largely external to the bourgeois institutions, the Mensheviks, on the other hand, sought to establish hegemony within the already existing bourgeois democratic institution, from which they could seize power and the demise of capitalism would reaffirm their revolutionary counter-hegemony. The divide between the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks would in later years come to define the split between revolutionary worker movements 
and social democratic movements, as many social democratic parties would eventually abandon all connections to Marxism in favor of a Keynesian compromise between socialism and capitalism by the mid to late 20th century. Although, following in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of global neoliberal capitalist hegemony, many self-proclaimed Marxist-Leninist parties today, such as the South African Communist Party, are in substance social democratic parties. During the 20th century, various proclaimed communist states, which were supposedly upholding the spirit of Marxism from the Soviet Union to China and North Korea, succumbed to the fears of underproduction and scarcity, resulting in centrally planned economies and heavy-handed state control over the lives of seemingly liberated workers. Both the Soviet Union and China saw the rapid urbanization of post-revolutionary cities in need of increased food cultivation to preserve the urban populations who were considered as integral to the development of a revolutionary society. In this regard, centrally planned productivist values were applied to agricultural production and the rural populace were sought to bear a temporary sacrifice for the creation of a revolutionary society. As Ponting states regarding the Soviet paradigm of nature, that socialism was to be built on the productive capacity of an advanced industrial society organized through the factory system with a large degree of state power. Communism would be more efficient than capitalism in producing goods. The possibilities open to such a society were therefore limitless. As Engels declared, the productivity of land can be infinitely increased by the application of capital, labor and science. Lenin and his successor Stalin were determined to give the development of industry the highest priority in the new state. The environmental consequences could be disregarded in the context of a materialist philosophy which saw the highest human achievement as the ability to alter the natural world as required. Events marked by such state-sanctioned anthropocentric productivism included Stalin's devastating collectivization of agriculture, which is understood to have resulted in the death of roughly 12 million people across the Soviet Union. Additionally, the establishment of Mao's agricultural communes are estimated to have caused the death of up to 30 million people. In both instances, the state withheld cultivated food from the rural populace and prioritized urban industrialization at the expense of rural laborers. Further fears of imperialism, counter-revolution and political dissent caused such communist states to abandon the socialist principles of worker democracy in favor of militarism, secret police and one-party state rule. The fusion of authoritarian, technocratic control and centrally planned economic production is what the Polish philosopher Zygmunt Bauman claims to have led to the demise of 20th century communism as an alternative to capitalism. As Bauman states, what has been buried under the debris of the communist system, a number of totalitarian states that left unprotected individuals at the mercy of rule free powers and which insulated the self reproduction of the political power holders from all and any intervention by the powerless. The fall of communism was a resounding defeat for the project of a total order, an artificially designed, all embracing arrangement of human actions and their setting, one that follows the rules of reason instead of emerging from diffuse and uncoordinated activities of human agents. It was also the downfall of the grandiose dream of remaking nature, forcing it to yield ever more of anything human satisfaction may require. From the start, communism was one-sidedly adapted to the task of mobilizing social and natural resources in the name of modernization, the 19th century steam and iron ideal of modern plenty. It could at least in its own view compete with capitalists, but solely with the capitalists engaged in the same pursuits. The fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 signified the victory of neoliberal capitalist hegemony and the end of history, as coined by the American political scientist Francis Fukuyama, which cast away the Marxist vision of a revolutionary transition from capitalism to socialism. Worker democracy was eclipsed by liberal democracy, as the ultimate expression of the people and worker control over the means of production was eclipsed by the unfettered liberalization of the free market which currently characterizes the neoliberal capitalism of the 21st century. As a result of this new period of neoliberal exceptionalism, the United States cemented its superpower status along with its prime financial institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which secured their global reach. Russia and its former Eastern European satellite states were subjected to free market disaster capitalism, 
which ruthlessly materialized new forms of inequalities in hierarchies based on corporate power and worker exploitation. The collapse of the Soviet Union and its satellite states in the late 1980s and early 1990s ended the world's brief and limited flirtation with state-controlled socialism. Unrestrained free market capitalism became the only acceptable ideology. Governments had little choice but to go along with this trend and attempt to gain what benefits they could from an increasingly globalized economic system. International institutions such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund enthusiastically backed this process and used their power when they could to ensure that this ideology was accepted everywhere as the only route to economic success. China, Vietnam, Laos and Cuba also reorientated themselves towards a free market model in adherence to state intervention, all whilst rejecting liberal democracy in favor of one-party state rule. North Korea is the only country which remains distinctly dedicated to a centrally planned economy as attributed to pre-reform 20th century communist regimes. Regardless of such end of history claims, the crisis of capitalism has nonetheless continued into the 21st century with a plethora of ideological critiques with some ranging from a largely free market or Keynesian aligned paradigm which only perceives the crisis of capitalism in terms of financial crisis, with other critiques taking a more multifaceted approach and recognizing the complex interplay between financial, ecological and social crisis. Certainly, the financial sector has played a pivotal role in the crisis of capitalism, as seen with the initial unleashing of the free market in the 1980s to the Asian financial crisis of 1997, and to the current financial crisis, which is overshadowed by the 2008 financial crisis and the 2020 COVID pandemic, deeming it a second Great Depression of sorts, which has had profound implications for modern capitalist societies. However, as many eco-Marxists such as John Bellamy Foster have declared, the current crisis of capitalism is inseparable to ecological crisis and that the financial crisis should not be exclusively understood as an isolated event. In an interview for Monthly Review magazine, Foster states regarding current left ecological movements that Militants need an ecological strategy that's different than the ecological strategy of capital. Capital, even when it says that it's dealing with the ecological problem, is actually dedicated to finding ways to expropriate nature and to exploit populations. And right now, the grand strategy is the financialization of nature, which takes control as well as ownership over ecosystems away from the population. The working class, the the proletariat has certain material relations generated by capitalism and are then are affected by capitalism. And these material conditions are not simply in the workplace. They're not simply in the narrow economic realm, but they also relate to housing, to the relation to the land, pollution, the connection to the forest, everything to do with the environment. And those material conditions are being disrupted and destroyed. And so the proletariat is broadening and organizing on wider material foundations. And I think the landless workers movement is an example of that. The landless workers movement being an agrarian Marxist aligned social movement in Brazil, which seeks to establish land reform measures, which would ensure greater access to sustainable land ownership for the rural landless population. The movement stands in opposition to rural urban inequalities, racism, sexism, and to private monopolies on land ownership, as an estimated 1% of the population owns 45% of all land in Brazil. With an estimated 5 million landless families, the landless workers movement has a membership of roughly 1.5 million, making it the largest social movement in Latin America. Ultimately, for Foster, the crisis of capitalism has deeper historical roots, which can be found in the original analysis of Marx, who understood the interrelations between early industrialization and the Earth's ecology in 19th century Britain. The most common views regarding Marx and ecology 
usually tend towards the notion that Marx had very little to do with ecology, and that a Promethean technocratic stance on nature herald him close to later Soviet perspectives on nature, or that Marx did address ecology, but that it was fundamentally separate from his analysis on labor and capital. As Foster makes clear, the widespread recognition of Karl Marx as a leading classical contributor to ecological thought is a fairly recent historical occurrence. The revival of Marx's ecology since the 1960s, and especially since the 1990s, occurred in a number of stages. The dominant interpretation on the left up through the 1980s faulted Marx for for his supposedly instrumentalist, Promethean conception of nature and alleged lack of an ecological sensibility. This view resulted in what has come to be known as first-stage eco-socialism, characterized by the grafting of green thought onto Marxism, or in some cases, Marxism onto green thought, based upon the presumption that Marx's entire critique was ecologically flawed. For scholars such as Foster, a reassessment on the writings of Marx reveals a distinct systemic analysis on ecology and environmental degradation within his writings, even if Marx did inevitably provide greater prominence to the labor-capital divide, given the pressing material conditions of his time. As Foster declares, in his most renowned philosophical book named Marx's Ecology, Materialism and Nature, that Marx's ecological insights were not mere flashes of genius, rather his insights in this area derived from a systemic engagement with the 17th century scientific revolution and the 19th century environment via a deep philosophical understanding of the materialist conception of nature. Thus Marx analyzed the human alienation from nature in a sophisticated and ecologically sensitive form. This tendency was reinforced by his concerns regarding human subsistence and the relationship to the soil and the whole problem of capitalist agriculture. Whilst environmental degradation and ecological crises predate modern capitalism, such destructive human tendencies were accelerated and intensified under Western industrialization, which Marx was subject to. Moreover, Marx's educational background in Epicurean materialism, along with his exposure to the natural sciences, which included Charles Darwin's Origins of the Species, was central to Marx's ecological approach. For Foster, many of the ecological problems which Marx and Engels were witness to included the division between town and country, soil depletion, industrial pollution, urban maldevelopment, the decline in health and crippling of workers, bad nutrition, toxicity, enclosures, rural poverty and isolation, deforestation, human-generated floods, desertification, water shortages, regional climate change, the exhaustion of natural resources, conservation of energy, entropy, the need to recycle the waste products of industry, the interconnections between species and their environments, historically conditioned problems of overpopulation, the causes of famine, and the issue of the rational employment of science and technology. In volume three of Das Kapital, Marx provides a brief insight into sustainable development. Even an entire society, a nation, or all simultaneously existing societies taken together are not owners of the earth, they are simply its possessors, its beneficiaries, and have to bequeath it in an improved state to succeeding generations. This statement by Marx was posited a century before the United Nations Brundtland Commission Report of 1987, which defined sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The report for many in the global south was considered a form of eco-imperialism, which justified neoliberal capitalist hegemony and foreign intervention in the name of ecological sustainability. The divide between the ecological justice movement and eco-imperialism was epitomized in the 1999 Seattle WTO protests, which saw counter-globalization protesters in conflict with the Seattle Police Department over the World Trade Organization's proposals to expand corporations and impose new free trade agreements on the Global South, which was to the benefit of multinational corporate monopolies, allowing them to exploit cheap labor and cast away environmental regulations all whilst imposing a corporatized vision of ecological sustainability onto developing nations. The counter-globalization protesters were severely punished by the Seattle police. However, greater awareness to globalization and neoliberal hegemony came as a result of the protests. For Marx, 
Sustainable human development can only appropriately occur from a change in the social relations of production. In this case, the private ownership of resources and nature must first be abolished. All progress in capitalistic agriculture is a progress in the art, not only of robbing the laborer, but of robbing the soil. All progress in increasing the fertility of the soil for a given time is a progress towards ruining the lasting sources of that fertility. Capitalist production, therefore, develops technology and the combining together of various processes into a social whole only by sapping the original sources of all wealth, the soil and the laborer. The uprooting and degradation of the soil is most evident in Marx's theory of the metabolic rift, which reveals the human alienation to nature as embedded into the process of industrialization, which results in humans who already perceive themselves as mere resources for exploitation, additionally coming to see nature as a mere resource for exploitation to maintain the rapid development of cities. Unlike the more mainstream anthropocentric understanding of the human relation to nature, which was pervasive throughout the 19th century, Marx crucially perceived humans as a part of nature and holding profoundly responsible and consequential power over ecology. Humans therefore had to respect the laws of nature, of which they are a part of, for which Marx declares, Labor is, in the first place, a process in which both man and nature participate, and in which man of his own accord starts, regulates and controls the material reactions between himself and nature. He opposes himself to nature as one of her own forces, setting in motion arms and legs, head and hands, the natural forces of his body, in order to appropriate nature's productions in a form adapted to his own wants. By thus acting on the external world and changing it, he at the same time changes his own nature. He develops his slumbering powers and compels them to act in obedience to his sway. It is the necessary condition for effecting exchange of matter between man and nature. It is the everlasting nature-imposed condition of human existence. For Marx, as a result of humanity's interconnectedness with nature, any attempts to change or alter nature ultimately changes humanity. In this case, the ecological degradation which proceeded with industrialization also degraded human life. Following in the works of German scientist Justus von Liebig, Marx recognized that the rift caused by ecological manipulation during the rapid industrialization of cities held disastrous consequences for humans and nature. During the industrialization process of the early to mid 19th century Britain, growing populations in the cities required an excess supply of food to maintain the expanding population, as the majority of Britain's population now lived in cities. As the transition to industrial capitalism cast away the remnants of agrarian peasant life, Britain's agricultural industry was left depleted. In a desperate response to maintain the cities, Food and rich fertile soil was reallocated en masse towards the cities such as London, which saw the accumulation of human waste build up within the cities as waste was dumped into rivers or landfills, as opposed to being recycled. Nutrients from the soil, such as phosphorus, potassium and nitrogen, polluted the cities, resulting in serious dangers to public health and to the variety of epidemics which afflicted London throughout the early to mid 19th century. The River Thames in particular was deemed a river of death due to the excessive pollution found within the water which killed off a significant amount of fish life in the river during the 19th century. The soil itself which was initially extracted from the countryside was left degraded and infertile as the rich nutrients did not return to the soil. The crisis of agriculture led the British Empire to acquire a monopoly over Peruvian guano fertilizer through imperialist means. The drive to acquire fertilizer led the British Empire and other imperialist powers such as the United States, France, Germany and Japan to conquer sparse guano-rich islands. As foster states, during the period 1830 to 1870, the depletion of the natural fertility of the soil through the loss of soil nutrients was the central ecological concern of capitalist society in both Europe and North America. This period saw the growth of guano imperialism as nations scoured the globe for natural fertilizers. The first British boat carrying Peruvian guano, the accumulated dung of seabirds, arrived in Liverpool in 1835. By 1841, 1,700 tons were imported, and by 1847, some 220,000 tons arrived. So desperate were European farmers in this period that they raided the Napoleonic battlefields for bones to spread over their fields. However, towards the end of the 19th century, artificial fertilizer had been established and has remained the basis for modern agriculture under a capitalist system. Whilst Marx for his time, 
did not completely foresee the calamity of the ecological breakdown to come, nor did he uphold ecology to significant extents in his thought. Marx was, however, nonetheless attuned to its dangers as it related to his systemic analysis on capitalism stating that large landed property reduces the agricultural populations to an ever decreasing minimum and confronts it with an ever growing industrial population crammed together in large towns in this way it produces conditions that provoke an irreparable rift in the interdependent process of social metabolism a metabolism prescribed by the natural laws of life itself the result of this is a squandering of the vitality of the soil which is carried by trade far beyond the bounds of a single country for Marx, the ecological breakdown is in this respect embedded into the misery, suffering and poverty of the working classes in the cities, who endure a hostile, disease-ridden urban way of life which denigrates their health and mortality. By the same token, Marx speaks of the rural laborer, stating that capitalist production by collecting the population in great centers and causing an ever-increasing preponderance of town population on the one hand concentrates the historical motive power of society, on the other hand, it disturbs the circulation of matter between man and the soil, i.e. prevents the return to the soil of its elements consumed by man in the form of food and clothing. It therefore violates the conditions necessary to lasting fertility of the soil. By this action it destroys at the same time the health of the town laborer and the intellectual life of the rural laborer. Whilst Marx was remarking on the isolation of Britain's then desolate rural population, who were deprived of cultural, aesthetic and scientific development. Such a statement has often been misinterpreted to suggest Marx and Engels held low opinions towards the rural way of life and therefore towards the peasantry in other parts of the world from which the remnants of feudalism survived, such as Imperial Russia. Although it is understood that Marx held and expressed generally favorable views towards historical peasant leaders in German history, such as the early 16th century Reformation theologian Thomas Munzer, who led the German Peasants' Revolt. For Foster, the anthropocentric perception of Marx as a Promethean dominator of nature who could only perceive the persistent drive towards industrialization as a precondition for worker emancipation is in this respect an unfitting description for Marx and respectively Engels, who recognized the limits of industrialization and the nuanced effect it had upon ecology. Marx's concept of metabolic rift in the relation between town and country, human beings and the earth, allowed him to penetrate to the roots of what historians have sometimes called the second agricultural revolution, occurring in the capitalism of his day and the crisis in agriculture with which this was associated, thereby enabling him to develop a critique of environmental degradation that anticipated much of present-day ecological thought. Whilst ecology remained evident in Marx's philosophical thought, the 20th century torchbearers to Marxism had largely abandoned an ecological project. However, in more recent years, there has been an ecological revival of Marxist philosophy, which is presenting a new form of eco-Marxism and eco-socialism for the 21st century. In the early 20th century, ecology was addressed by various Marxist revolutionaries, from Vladimir Lenin to Rosa Luxemburg, Nikolai Bukharin, and to scientists of the pre-Stalin Soviet Union. However, following the death of Lenin in 1924, the subsequent Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, embarked on an industrialization at all costs economic plan, from which the ecological component to Marxist thought was destroyed. The rapid industrialization of the Soviet Union towards state capitalism shared many similarities with the industrial capitalist development of Western nations, particularly as it relates to the devastation of the rural populace and ecology at the cost of forging cities of economic significance. However, this path towards rigorous economic development was championed by Soviet-aligned Marxists who believed that the Soviet Union could outpace the West in terms of industrial development. Other revolutionary socialist movements relegated ecology in favor of purely economic conditions, which for the 20th century working class was perceived as the most pressing issues of their time. In the intellectual and philosophical realm of 20th century Marxism, the dialectical contradictions innate to capitalism were not to be applied to nature, which was understood to be separate to the transformations throughout history and society. It would only be in the 1970s with the rise of the environmental movement that Marxists began to reorientate themselves back towards ecology, and Marxism itself has only been conceived to possess an ecological dimension in recent decades, most notably from the works of John Bellamy Foster. The reinvigoration of Marx and ecology can also be observed in the reassessment of 19th century German sociologist Max Weber, 
who recognize the finite resources of fossil fuels which upheld capitalist societies and the concerning heedless consumption of such resources for which there are no alternatives. The rediscovery of an ecological Marxism which is thoroughly related to the current crisis of capitalism, has profound political implications for the future of socialist and ecological movements. With the failure of the industrial working class to abolish capitalism throughout the 20th century, either as a result of the failed state capitalist projects or through the absorption of the working class into capitalist hegemony, nature has nonetheless presented itself as a potential death blow to the capitalist system for the 21st century. Such a death blow, however, will come at the cost of human life as humans are a part of the very nature which the neoliberal capitalist system recklessly deteriorates. From the finite limits of fossil fuels to global warming, pollution and to the collapse of delicate ecosystems which first and foremost threatens life as we understand it on the planet, but also deeply undermines the stability and structure of a capitalist system. Other more extreme responses to the climate crisis can be observed in ecocentric movements of primitivism, deep ecology, neo-Malthusianism and anti-natalism, whose focus of critique is not exclusively upon the effects of a capitalist system on ecology, but broadly upon a technologically advanced human presence on the planet, which is a threat in of itself. Therefore, the struggle is not an interhuman struggle over the means of production, but rather a struggle between humanity and nature itself. Whilst primitivism, which is typically aligned with anarchist thought, and spearheaded by anarcho-primitivist philosopher John Zerzan, seeks to abolish industrial civilization altogether and return to a state of hunter-gathering. Antinatalism, on the other hand, perceives birth and procreation as unethical and or immoral. Certainly such ecocentric narratives are a minority voice, although 19th century egalitarian forms of utopianism which sought to return industrial workers back to a pre-industrial agrarian way of life were more pervasive in the times of Marx and Engels, with the Welsh textile owner and social reformer Robert Owen being the founder of utopian socialism, who sought to establish self-sufficient agrarian communities in the early 19th century. Regarding German modernization and the German revolutionary movement which would eventually amass in the German Revolution of 1848, Marx declared that it is not radical revolution or universal emancipation which is a utopian dream for Germany. It is the partial, merely political revolution which leaves the pillars of the building standing. Revolution for Marx had to be grounded within the material conditions of the current society. Any attempts to return to a romanticized pre-industrial society are doomed to failure. In this sense, Marx is both anti-anthropocentric and anti-utopian, putting him at odds with anyone who might utilize his thought for any current eco-utopian dreams of returning to a romanticized past. However, certainly not all reactions to the climate crisis hold radical measures with more free market, liberal aligned paradigms perceiving sustainability as something already embedded into economic growth and who simply believe that corporations can engage in carbon trading to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. In simple words, carbon trading takes place within cap and trade systems such as the European Union's allowance system from which corporations are structured with a threshold on the amount of carbon they can emit and if a corporation goes beyond the emissions threshold they therefore have to pay into the system to make up for the excess emissions. Corporations that meet the implementations of the cap-and-trade system are additionally permitted to sell their surplus threshold to other corporations who will buy such extended thresholds to extend their carbon emissions. In this case, the capitalist system provides financial incentive to maintain emission stability but still nonetheless profits from the pollution of the atmosphere. Additionally, from this paradigm, whether or not green technologies replace fossil fuels will depend on the invisible hand of the free market and on the certainty that entrepreneurs will have the solutions. More Keynesian or social democratic proposals include the solutions of a Green New Deal, which seeks to replace fossil fuels with more sustainable green technologies, such as wind, solar and hydroelectric energy sources, which would be integrated within a mixed economic framework of regulated capitalism. From this paradigm, while certain industries would operate under government control, the private sector would be financially incentivized to invest in such green technologies. Germany, in particular, is largely recognized as a nation that will produce all of its electricity with renewable energies by 2050. Although nuclear energy for many environmentalists, such as the British environmentalist George Monbiot, remains a necessary alternative to fossil fuels. However, the sustainability of nuclear energy certainly remains controversial, especially considering how capital-intensive nuclear energy tends to be. The compromise 
compromise between green politics and capitalism is for many eco-Marxists emblematic of an environmental movement undergoing desperate circumstances, from which capitalism can continue to pursue economic growth with green adjustments to a world of rising temperatures. In recent years, as a result of state intervention to disband climate activism across various capitalist societies, capitalist hegemony is ensuring it will not capitulate to activist demands and a compromise from environmentalists seeking desperate measures to avoid the worst effects of climate change is in this respect understandable. An eco-Marxist analysis, which is undeniably in favor of such environmentalism, at least in the short term, is however nonetheless more inclined towards a systemic understanding of how capitalism relates to pollution, imperial plunder, and mass poverty, as it is maintained through a hierarchy of neoliberal international trade agreements which itself originates from the carcass of Western colonial relations to the colonized world. Writing in 1913, German Marxist and socialist revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg declared of capitalist imperialism in her book The Accumulation of Capital that imperialism is the political expression of the accumulation of capital in its competitive struggle for what remains still open of the non-capitalist environment. The immense masses of capital accumulated in the old countries seek an outlet for their surplus product and strive to capitalize their surplus value and the rapid change over to capitalism of the pre-capitalist civilizations. On the international stage, then, capital must take appropriate measures. With the high development of the capitalist countries and their increasingly severe competition in acquiring non-capitalist areas, imperialism grows in lawlessness and violence, both in aggression against the non-capitalist world and in ever more serious conflicts among the competing capitalist countries. For Luxembourg, the capitalist drive to expand the accumulation of capital reveals itself in imperialist endeavors, along with the acquisition of new resources and the creation of a new proletariat, who are, as a result of the destruction of local native industries, made dependent on a capitalist system for survival, alienated from their traditional ways of life and regimented within some form of a racial caste system. This extensive expansion of capitalism for Luxembourg can only be achieved through the coordination of ruthless violence as perpetuated by a military force. Militarism fulfills a quite definite function in the history of capital, accompanying as it does every historical phase of accumulation. It plays a decisive part in the first stages of European capitalism, in the period of the so-called primitive accumulation as a means of conquering the New World and the spice-producing countries of India. Later, it is employed to subject the modern colonies, to destroy the social organizations of primitive primitive societies so that their means of production may be appropriated, forcibly to introduce commodity trade in countries where the social structure had been unfavorable to it, and to turn the natives into a proletariat by compelling them to work for wages in the colonies. In the accumulation of capital, various examples of colonialism from British colonialism in India, French colonialism in Algeria, to the exploitation of indigenous American and African peoples is a clear reminder for Luxembourg on how capitalism thrives against a background of racial violence, murder and servitude. Furthermore, Luxembourg remained critical of the German Social Democratic Party's silence on the German imperial expansion into Africa, at a time when the party was increasing in political strength. Through writing various pamphlets and articles, Luxembourg brought greater awareness to the genocide taking place by the German Empire against the Nama and Herero people of colonial Namibia, and was profoundly critical of the Social Democratic Party's leadership, which failed to condemn the Kaiser's imperial campaign into Morocco for fear of losing parliamentary seats. Luxembourg's connection to suffering people across the globe stemmed in part from her experiences of anti-Semitism in Germany. Continuing from the analysis of Rosa Luxemburg, British Marxist and economic geographer David Harvey has coined the term accumulation of dispossession, from which the mass expansion of neoliberal capitalism across the globe has resulted in a distinct concentration and division of wealth and power, which is notably characterized by the global north-south divide. Core nations representing the immense concentration of capital include, although not limited to, the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Japan, and South Korea, for example, are beneficiary states of such neoliberal hegemony. The World Population Review defines core countries as wealthy, developed and industrialized countries, that middle and low income countries, 
typically classified as semi-periphery and periphery countries, depend on for economic assistance. Core countries tend to have a wide variety of resources at their disposal, command large and well-funded militaries, and possess advanced economies that enable them to influence the global economic market. The post-colonial world or periphery nations who are subjected to the laws imposed by the global economic market are on the other hand marked by extreme inequality, poverty and exploitation, albeit to varying extents. As core nations in the shadow of colonialism ensure a state of dependence for periphery nations through debt, private monopolies on resource extraction, and through the inexpensive exportation of raw materials, which are imported back onto periphery societies as higher priced finished products. One measure through which this system is enforced in periphery states is through the backing of authoritarian regimes who are willing to collaborate with core capitalist states in assurance that they maintain power over the populace. Such power structures are historically epitomized in the rule of Congolese dictator Mobutu Sese Seko, who first rose to political prominence through the violence of the Congo crisis in the early to mid-1960s. The rule of Burkinabe president, Blaise Compore, who oversaw the assassination of the Marxist revolutionary leader, Thomas Sankara, in 1987, and in the rule of Chadian war criminal, Hesine Habre, who assumed power in 1982, all of which had close relations to the West as bulwarks against communism in Africa. Semi-periphery nations which still retain economic processes of cheap labor production, such as China and India, also hold the potential to become core nations, as China is expected to end its cheap labor production by 2025 and become the world's leading economy either as early as the 2030s or as late as the mid-21st century. The expansion of core nations in what is typically designated the Global South, however, does not alter the core periphery division of labor, wealth, and power, but rather simply establishes new economic hierarchical relations and new concentrations of capital, especially considering that China is in the process of offshoring cheap manufacturing industries to African nations which preserve poor worker rights. For a global capitalist system that is grounded on persistent accumulation and economic growth, the economic relations of dependency, servitude and exploitation upon the periphery are a prerequisite for the flourishing of such an economic system. Therefore, any attempt to integrate environmental and or ecological solutions within a core capitalist system will only offshore the most adverse polluting and carbon emitting industries to regions of the global south, ensuring that the accumulation process of modern industrial capitalism continues. Regarding the neo-imperialism of current international economic relations, Harvey states that military interventions are the tip of the imperialist iceberg. Hegemonic state power is typically deployed to ensure and promote those external and international institutional arrangements, through which the asymmetries of exchange relations can so work as to benefit the hegemonic power. It is through such means that tribute is in effect extracted from the rest of the world. Free trade and open capital markets have become primary means through which to advantage the monopoly powers based in the advanced capitalist countries that already dominate trade, production, services and finance within the capitalist world. The primary vehicle for accumulation by dispossession, therefore, has been the forcing open of markets throughout the world by institutional pressures exercised through the IMF and the WTO, backed by the power of the United States to deny access to its own vast market to those countries that refuse to dismantle their protections. Within the eco-Marxist framework, capitalism in its totality needs to be overcome to ensure environmental harmony and ecological sustainability for all people across the world, as opposed to an elite few. The inexhaustible destructive tendencies of global capitalism is exemplified in Foster's most recent book called Capitalism in the Anthropocene, ecological ruin or ecological revolution, from which he declares, capitalism begins with the extensive external expropriation of lands and bodies. It then uses this as the basis from which it constructs a system of intensive internal exploitation of human labor. In this dual process of expropriation and exploitation, capitalist private property exhausts the environmental conditions of production and life, seeking to externalize this destruction onto the wider social and ecological realms on a global basis. It follows that as capitalism proceeds with its accumulation on an increasingly global basis, its destruction simply knows no barriers, extending to the world environment as a whole. 
the destructive and decadent ascension of capitalism, is also shared by Marx and Engels, from which they state in the German ideology that, in the development of productive forces, there comes a stage when productive forces and means of intercourse are brought into being, which, under the existing relations, only cause mischief and are no longer productive but destructive forces. These productive forces receive under the system of private property a one-sided development only, and for the majority they become destructive forces. Moreover, a great many of these forces can find no application at all within the system of private property. Labor and production now diverge to such an extent that material life appears as the end, and what produces this material life labor as a means. Thus things have now come to such a pass that the individuals must appropriate the existing totality of productive forces not only to achieve self-activity but also merely to safeguard their very existence. For foster, agrarian and indigenous movements within the global south and across the broader world are at the center of 21st century revolutionary socialism stating that the objective consequence of the changing social and ecological environment, the product of uncontrolled capitalist globalization and accumulation arising from forces at the center of the system is inevitably to create a more globally interconnected revolutionary struggle, a new eco-revolutionary wave emanating primarily from the global south. As exemplars of this modern visionary eco-socialist movement, Foster heralds the landless workers movement in Brazil, Cuba's sustainable urban agriculture, the anti-extractivist movements in Africa, the Farmers' Revolt in India, the Via Campesina International Farmers' Organization, and the Red New Deal, which is an ecological proposal put forward by the New Mexico-based indigenous advocacy group called the Red Nation, which seeks to overturn the capitalist model of agriculture and incorporate modern sustainable technology into indigenous land management among other demands. Regarding the role of indigenous people in the eco-proletariat movement, Lakota historian and indigenous organizer Nick Estes, who also co-founded the Red Nation, declared that indigenous peoples must lead the way. Our history and long traditions of indigenous resistance provide possibilities for futures premised on justice. After all, indigenous resistance is animated by our ancestors' refusal to be forgotten, and it is our resolute refusal to forget our ancestors and our history that animates our vision for liberation. There is a capaciousness to indigenous kinship that goes beyond the human. Whereas past revolutionary struggles have strived for the emancipation of labor from capital, we are challenged not just to imagine, but to demand the emancipation of the earth from capital. For the earth to live, capitalism must die. For Foster, the rise of an eco-proletariat holds profound implications for the world, stating that the first stirrings of what can be conceived as a new revolutionary wave, different than the ones that came before, but emanating primarily from the global south and now emerging in response to capitalism in the Anthropocene. 21st century revolutionary praxis necessarily operates within a wider field combining the struggles for socialism and ecology. It represents a new materiality of hope rooted in the movements of hundreds of millions, potentially billions of people seeking to transcend the oppressions of class, race, gender, environmental injustice and imperialism emanating from the empire of capital. These struggles necessarily entail new revolutionary vernaculars arising in specific historical and cultural contexts, embodying environmental as well as economic realities. In this sense, there is not a single model of proletarian revolution. Rather, today's movements towards socialism and ecology encompass peasant and indigenous struggles while converging in complex ways with the struggles of a still expanding industrial and post-industrial working class, confronting a rapidly changing environment environment, engendered by capital's creative destruction. Additionally, Foster perceives the Green New Deal and other social justice movements as a part of this eco-revolutionary movement, and somewhat more controversially, China's proposal for an ecological civilization as well. Regarding China's hegemonic rise, an ecological interpretation of Marxism has uniquely found prominence in the political and intellectual discourse of China. Whilst the People's Republic of China is deemed Marxist and socialist in name, China's economic practices are distinctly state capitalist and Promethean. Historically, however, ruling imperial Chinese dynasties have placed great philosophical emphasis on nature and on the role of nature to determine whether a ruling dynasty is in the midst of collapse or prosperity. With the reintegration of traditional Confucian thought into the Chinese political domain, a greater awareness to ecological degradation has caused many Chinese intellectuals to grapple with the contradictions innate to China's modernization in the 21st century. Chinese philosopher Zhu Huang wrote in an article for the Monthly Review that 
Today, ecological Marxism is part of the totality of Marxism in China. Ecological Marxism is regarded by some Chinese Marxists as not only one of the most influential movements in contemporary Western Marxism and a new development of Marxism, but also as a very important force among various ecological theories. China in recent years has invested heavily into clean energy, green technologies and the infrastructural cultivation of eco-cities, making China the global leader in renewable energy expansion. However, China's commitment to Marxism and socialism, at least on a political and economic level, is certainly dubious at large. In South Africa as well, there is growing consciousness within labor movements on the connection between capitalism and ecological crisis. With the National Union of Metal Workers at the forefront of recognizing the climate crisis in relation to a capitalist system. Ultimately, the fusion between Marxism and ecology is challenging dominant narratives around the world regarding persistent economic growth and accumulation. Whilst the future cannot be fully predicted, it is likely many parts of the world will adapt to a social democratic Green New Deal solution, which oversees a regulated form of capitalism. However, with the rise of a new far right in the West, which not only denies the existence of climate change and engages in conspiracy theories regarding solutions to climate change, but actively seeks to continue the plunder of the world's natural resources to maintain the power of a neoconservative capitalist elite. The transformations needed to take place so as to mitigate the most adverse effects of climate change might not take place in parts of the Western world if governments and corporations continue to actively resist such changes. The response of any far-right authoritarian regime in a period of climate crisis and mass migration from the global south would be one of vicious militant nationalism, from which the state and vigilante groups would take it into their own hands to control the profound results of climate change through brute force. Certainly, if far-right regimes adapt to the realities of climate change, they might enact scathing laws and policies in the name of green sovereignty as a form of eco-fascism, which will take desperate measures to control a climate-ridden population. In other parts of the world more directly affected by rising temperatures, authoritarian or totalitarian regimes might possess strict control over the population's way of life and resources. To maintain a dwindling society, through controlled rations at a time of immense socio-economic scarcity. The renowned ecological anarchist Murray Bookchin foresees this tragic future in an interview, declaring that if people will live, I can envision, and I will not be around to see it, but it's by no means inconceivable, and they will live under huge domes, surrounded by what is virtually a desert, almost as though they live in a radioactive area, surrounded by a desert. And we will then have to have a command economy and a command society based on coercion, deciding how many children a uh, population should produce, uh, what food and how much food they should consume. In short, placing a military discipline on people and thereby creating what amounts to ecological fascism. Crucially, 21st century eco-Marxism complements the diverse fusion of Marxism, environmentalism and ecological indigenous practices and movements in a state of mutual respect for one another. This certainly comes in recognition that Marx and Engels were a product of their times, and whilst they did provide an ecological analysis upon the effects of industrial capitalism, they could not have comprehended the depths and complexities of the current ecological crisis facing the earth in the 21st century. For eco-Marxism to be intellectually and philosophically effective, environmentalism should not be perceived as detached from class struggle, and Marxism should not be perceived as detached from ecology. Rather, the two paradigms together provide a greater understanding of both the crisis of capitalism and the crisis of climate change. As Foster reaffirms, Marx can be said to have prefigured in his social and ecological analysis the central aspects of the epochal struggle of our times. As capitalism continues to destabilize the metabolism between humans and nature. For Marx, the very nature of capitalist society from the very beginning had been built on a metabolic rift between city and country, human beings and the earth a rift that has now been heightened beyond anything that he could have imagined. There is an irreversible environmental crisis within global capitalist society. Whether or not one subscribes to a more liberal or radical approach to the concerns of climate change, 
Certainly, any reconsideration to the hegemonic economic order of things is worth engaging and considering. Indeed, the case for many left ecological movements is not the immediate destabilizing overturn of capitalism, but rather a gradual process towards assuming a counter-hegemony of thought and practice for long-term prospects. As ecological indigenous movements in Latin American countries, such as Bolivia and Ecuador, have provided the earth constitutional rights with the firm support of indigenous communities. As the authors of the book called People First Economics make clear, the call to transform the distorted relations between capital society and nature comes from many different perspectives. The indigenous peoples of the Andes speak of the ultimate crisis, the civilizational crisis, that obliges us to reimagine what it means to live well. Bolivian president Evo Morales describes this as thinking not only in terms of income per capita, but also of cultural identity, community, and harmony among ourselves and with our Mother Earth. Mechanistic and productivist attempts at socialism ultimately failed because they ignored some essential truths that reforming politics and institutions must begin with the real lives of people and remain in harmony with nature. Ultimately, with a rising awareness and consciousness towards an ecological framework of Marxism and towards the Earth's finite resources, daring to ignore such a reality will possess unbridled consequences for the future of world history and for the future of human civilization itself. So long as there is a continued crisis of climate and capitalism, a rising eco-proletariat revolutionary movement can only grow in prominence, demand more recognition for the Earth, and persist in deep political, economic, and ecological relevance.